Sister Amen. As I said, guys, so again, the text book is given to all of you. Okay, today we'll be talking about the very important topic about this. Uh, as we're dealing with this Christology at the moment, uh, we'll be seeing more a topic on that. So we would like to uh, once again a recap of the whole thing. Uh, to understand that in Jesus Christ, what does the Bible, does the Bible say about Jesus? Is Jesus Christ God according to Old Testament? And then we also see from New Testament, is it true that <clears throat> the Bible uh, is a justified that Jesus is God? Okay. So we're going to see on this topic. So at the same time, <coughs> time to time I would refer to Okay. Time to time, we'll also see from the scripture uh, references and also from, uh, um, from the whiteboard. We'll try to let you know. It's amazing. First of all, let's turn the Bible and uh, see from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Let's determine, first of all, <clears throat> according to the Old Testament, is Jesus Christ the one true God? So the question here is, what does the Old Testament say about the deity of Christ? And does the Old Testament testify that Jesus is the one true God? Okay, this topic we would like to see. Let's read up first Isaiah 9 6. Okay, let's begin the reading. Hello. Okay, let's hear from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Somebody read up. For us to us, the child is born, to us, the son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Now, Isaiah 9 6 is one of the most powerful proof that Jesus is God. And therefore, it says, For unto the child is born, the son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So the terms child and son refers to the incarnation or manifestation of the mighty God and the everlasting Father. So again, Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah would be called Emmanuel, that is God with us. So now, this is something that you need to remember. That according to the Judaism, they said Messiah. They're still confused. The majority of the rabbis and the Jewish people could not understand the fact that Messiah himself would be as the God himself. He would be, you know, the God of Abraham, the Abraham. And therefore, they don't think to understand that Messiah would be the son of David according to the flesh. But what they do not understand is that the Messiah would be the son of David according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, he would be the God of David and the God of Abraham. And this is something that even to this day, the Jewish people, including the rabbis and their teachers, do not understand that. But then we can see from the Isaiah that the Messiah would be called Emmanuel. That means God with us. Let's turn again to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. So Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says, 
If the Lord himself shall give you a sign, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Right? Emmanuel, that means God with us. And this was the prophecy. We know that this is exactly fulfilled in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 to 23. And that's the reason why that, that Isaac described the, the Messiah as born a branch out of Jesse. Because Jesse is the father of David. And as the root of Jesse, according to Isaac chapter 11, verse 1 to 10. And Revelation 32, verse 16. So according to the flesh, he was a descendant, a branch of Jesse and David. But according to his spirit, he was the creator and source of life, root. So Jesus used this concept to confound the Pharisees when he quoted from Psalm 110, verse 1, and asked, in a sense, how could David call the Messiah Lord when the Messiah was to be the son or descendants of David? You can see that again from this argument, it's found in Matthew 22. And verse 41 on words. Let's have a look at it again from Gospel Matthew chapter 22. Let's focus on verse 41. And while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What think ye of Christ? The Christ is the Greek word, keep that in mind. In Hebrew we say Messiah. Okay? But what's the meaning? The meaning is the anointed one. So Jesus was asking to those Pharisees, the Jewish Pharisees, and saying, What think ye of Messiah? Whose son is he? Then they immediately gave the response, saying, They said to him, The son of David. Were they right? Absolutely. Was Jesus Christ, was the Messiah, the son of David, according to the flesh? Absolutely. And therefore, even a Apostle Paul was trained by the Gabalites, who grew up from the Gabalites' feet, and who is also considered known as the Pharisees of the Pharisee. He also, you know, testified that in the Romans 1 3, you can also have a look at from the Romans, Epistle of Romans, chapter 1, verse 13. Here is your say, uh, in, in, sorry, verse uh, verse three. Okay, Romans chapter one, verse three. The apostle Paul says that concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Amen. So now, even uh, apostle Paul has acknowledged and said <coughs> that concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. So. We are not denying that, that Messiah, according to flesh, is the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of Jesse, or descendants of David and Jesse. <clears throat> but according to the Spirit, he would be the God of Abraham, David, and Jesse again. And that is the reason why we can go back again to Matthew 22. As soon as when they responded to the Lord Jesus Christ saying he's the son of David, then Jesus Christ goes on to say, How then do David and Spirit call him Lord? And the word Lord here means Yahweh or Zehua. Okay? And to substitute the word Yahweh and Zehua, we use in Hebrew Adonai. But Adonai is only the name of Adonai is used only for the one true God, for the God of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac. You cannot use the word Adonai for your master, your earthly master, or for your professor, or for your teacher. You cannot use the word Adonai. Well, in Hebrew, you can use the word Adon, but not Adonai. Because Adonai is the only appropriate word that can be used to substitute Yahweh and Zehubah. Okay, so. And Jesus Christ said unto them, How then did David in the Spirit call him Lord? Say, My Lord said to my Lord, 
The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If, I can focus on verse 45, if David then call him Lord, Adonai, Yahweh, how is he his son? And here the phrases have no answer. And no man was able to answer him a word neither to any man from that day forth as if any more questions. That means from that day onward, <clears throat> they do not dare to ask any more questions. So even to this day, <clears throat> in the land of Israel, all these rabbis, they would understand that Messiah would be the son of David. They do, they do understand that. But this is something they do not even understand even to this day. That according to the flesh, the Messiah would be the son of David, but according to the spirit, he would be the God of David and Abraham. So this is something they could not comprehend it even to this day. And the other problem with the Judaism Jews is that they condemn the entire New Testament, they deny that it's part of the canon. And they, they do not consider it to be part of the Holy Scripture. And the only reason why they condemn the New Testament is that because if they allow uh, the New Testament, then the people will have access to the New Testament. <clears throat> and then they can easily understand that Jesus Christ was actually the God of Abraham and Isaac in his deity. They would understand that Jesus was none other but the God of Abraham and Isaac. At the same time, he is the promised Messiah. But since they have denied the entire New Testament, and they for till today they could not understand who is the Messiah. Right? But they are still waiting for so-called the real Messiah. They are still saying that we are still waiting for the Messiah to come. But even though it was even references from I looked at the one where it says, we looked at to where today in the city of David, the Messiah, the Christ was born. But they don't believe the New Testament, so it does not make any sense. It's a very unfortunate for them. <clears throat> but <clears throat> while Jesus was on the earth, when Jesus read this Christ search, how then they would call the Messiah Lord, when the Messiah was to be the son of David, they don't have the answer. So once again, we can fully understand that the Old Testament indeed testified that Jesus is God. And then we can also focus from the Isaiah 35 verse 46 shows that Jesus is God. Let's read out again from Isaiah chapter 35 verse 46. From the book of Isaiah chapter 35. Verse 46 says, Isaiah chapter 35, verse 46. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with recompense, and he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man reap as the harp and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Amen. <clears throat> so now we know that this is a prophecy. And then Jesus applied these particular passages of scripture to himself when he turned the Bible in Luke chapter 7, verse 22. Now let's read out. From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verse 22. And you may please underline that to understand it. Amen. So let's see how does Jesus Christ apply this passage of Scripture to Himself. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verse 22. Then Jesus answering and said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things. You have seen and heard how that the blind see, 
the lamb walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised to the poor, the gospel is praised. Blessed is he who shall shall not be offended in me. Amen. You see that? So this is how the Jesus Christ applied himself. All these, uh, the scripture passage in Isaiah 35, verse 4 to 6, we know that this particular passage was you know, being quoted, and Jesus applied this passage of scripture to himself in Luke chapter 7, verse 22. And of course, his ministry did produce all of this thing. Now the ministry of the Jesus Christ is a clear evidence and a solid evidence, solid proof that Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament, is the God of the Israel. And then we go to see again in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, which clearly says, because Isaiah 40, verse 3 declares that the one who cried in the wilderness, said, Prepare the way of the Lord. And make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And this particular passage, the verse of scripture in the Old Testament, is once again fulfilled in the ministry of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist fulfilled this prophecy when he prepared the way for Jesus. So Jesus is the Lord and our God. So when you confront between Isaiah chapter 40, and verse 3, and when you compute that with Matthew 3, 3, then you can understand who is our Lord Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ God, according to the Old Testament? Alright? What does it say? That He is God. Alright? He is our Lord and our God. And then, that's the reason why you can call myself my Lord and my God. Let's read out again. Uh... See that in Isaiah 40, verse 3. You can just underline that again. The voice of him that cried in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. You can see the Lord here, the capitals, the letters. It's all in a capital letter. L is a capital, O is a capital, R is a capital, D is a capital. What does it mean? Now you would read this uh, particular verse of scripture in a Hebrew text, it would say Yahweh. Okay? That is according to the old Hebrew form. And a new Hebrew form says Jehuah. So please don't confuse between this Yahweh and Jehuah. Jehuah is a new Hebrew form, and Yahweh is all Hebrew form. <clears throat> but whenever you come across this YHWH, understand this. Okay, this particular <coughs> word is actually referring to the one true God, who is also known as the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Whenever the words of the passage or the scripture is referring, okay, the word when it's referring to the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, the case of being by the translator would always put it in a capital letter. Not in a small letter, it's all in capital letters. L is a capital, O is a capital, R is a capital, and D is a capital. Alright? Then you can also see that even God is a capital. The Z is capital, which means, right, this verse of scripture is talking about, okay, Yahweh and Elohim. So, this is the prophecy. Which was indeed fulfilled in Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. So when you when you confront between Isaiah 40 verse 3 with the gospel of Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, then you can understand that Jesus Christ our Lord is indeed is the God of the Old Testament. He is the Lord, Yahweh, and Elohim, according to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Now let's go down to the next one. Let's also focus from the Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Because Micah chapter 5 verse 2 proved that Messiah is actually God. Amen. But the problem is that even to this day, the modern day rabbis and the Jewish people are still confused. That itself is the proof they don't have 
the knowledge of them. They may study the Old Testament hundred times, thousand times, but they don't have the knowledge of God. For science of the former six clearly states that my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Now, why do they lack the knowledge? Because they don't consider that Jesus Christ is God. And he is the one who can give you the wisdom and the knowledge. And when you deny him, from where do you get this knowledge? And this is the reason why today, even among our Christians, community, among this Christian, uh, you know, so-called the Protestant, the Bible-believing churches, people who believe that Jesus Christ is the one for God, or who believe in the oneness doctrine, or apostolic biblical doctrine, they would have more understanding, they would have a deeper knowledge of God, but usually people who come from the Trinitarian backgrounds, or who affiliate themselves with this Roman Catholicism's uh, <coughs> doctrinal statements, or who uphold and believe in this Roman Catholicism doctrine, usually they don't have much knowledge about them. Uh, because uh, they don't adhere to this uh, biblical doctrine, which clearly approve, which clearly say that Jesus is God. Now, therefore, you can see here in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, prove that Messiah is God. Let's turn the Bible now. From Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Let's turn it quickly. All right. So what does it say here? It says, But thou, Elohim, Ephratah, though thou be the leader among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from all, from everlasting. Amen. Hallelujah. So here we can understand only God is everlasting. Amen. And then from the birth of scripture, this message clearly proved that Jesus is God. Thus the Old Testament, you can say, the Old Covenant, clearly states that the Messiah and the Savior to come will be God himself. And therefore, we can prove it from the Old Testament that Jesus is indeed the one true God. And according to the Old Testament, I'm not talking about the New Testament, According to the Old Testament, Jesus is indeed the Lord God Almighty. Now let me prove you more further than this one. Let us also see from Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6. Now these are the references. I want you guys to memorize it. And this will help you in the days to come a lot. Let's see again Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6. Thus says the Lord again, the Lord here is capital L-O-R-D, which means Yahweh or Zehuah. Thus is the Lord the King of Israel, and the Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, says that I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Amen. All we have to do here is just confront between this verse of scripture with the New Testament. So the one who is saying that I'm the first and last said there is no God, according to this passage, according to this verse of scripture, he is the one true God, the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Amen. You can say God the Father. Now, who has spoken over here in this verse of scripture? God the Father. Amen. The one true God, the God of the Old Testament. But if you see there in the New Testament, in the Revelation chapter 1 verse 8, and also Revelation 22, in verse 13, Jesus Christ claimed that he is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. So Revelation 22 verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. Amen. See that? And also replace the one eight. 
Once again, the Jesus Christ said, I'm the first and I'm the last. I'm the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. So when you confront it to him, the Old Testament and the New Testament, when you do comparison, you can clearly understand that according to the Old Testament, that Jesus Christ is fully the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Addison. So the Old Testament indeed testify that Jesus is the one true God. And also let's go a little bit more further. Let us also turn again to Isaiah 44 and let us fix our eyes on verse 24 again. Now, according to verse 24, Thus is the Lord thy Redeemer, he did form thee from the womb. I am the Lord, in this capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which means the God of Abraham, the human Isaac, the one true God, has spoken over here and said, and that make it all things, the street for the heavens alone, and that spread it above the earth by myself. You see, and the Lord is saying, I have created this heavens and earth by myself. In a very simple word, God is saying, according to this verse of scripture, the one true God, the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, has claimed over here that I am the one who made this heaven. I am the one who made this all this, the universe, and including this earth, and I am the one who has made all this thing by myself. And alone, I have laid the foundations of this earth. <coughs> I have spread for the heavens and the earth. I made all this thing by myself. You see that? And then you can just compare this verse of scripture with Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. What does it say here in Colossians 1 16? Okay, brother uh, Freddy, you read out Colossians 1 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Amen. See, the language is very strong. All right. So here it says, for by him. And everyone knows that the single pronoun him here is actually referring to the one true God. But in the New Testament here, this is him is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody knows that. There is nobody in heaven and earth that can deny this biblical fact. Amen. That this verse of scripture, for by him, the singular pronoun him is referring to the Lord Jesus. There is no one on this universe who can deny that. As far as the Bible is concerned, as far as the scripture is concerned, we can all understand that this verse of scripture, him, is referring to the one and only, our Lord Jesus Christ. So see the language how tough it is. For by him were all things created. So it does not say by, uh, <coughs> for through him. It says by him. And that's the reason why we do not want to use it. It's just kind of modern, you know, a Bible version. Because the modern versions in English would always use a through him, through him, through him. And they will not say by him. There's a big difference between through him. And by him. If I say through him, that means I can uh, accomplish my mission, my work through Brother Zhao, Brother Robot. Or I can accomplish my work and my mission through Sister Meno or Ali. Okay, they can accomplish the work. Okay, my work, I can give them that, that authority and for the power for one moment. And they can accomplish the work through, I mean, I can accomplish the work through them. A true her, a true you, but you may not be the permanent, you know, the one who is the authority. You may not be the principal or the professor, but still you can. If I give you the power for a moment, then you can accomplish the mission in the world. So that means you are not the one who is an authority. You have been given a power and authority, right, just for a moment to accomplish that mission. So that's the reason why you know we don't want to use it and. Uh, the modern version which says through him, through him all the time. But if you stick with the manuscript and from the Greek and Hebrew text, it's clearly said by him. Through is not him. Amen. 
So in other words, you can see that how much is the modern, uh, you know, English Bible versions is attacking the deity of Christ. Just because uh, it is not in the Holy Bible does not mean that it is accurate, alright? Especially the, the modern day in the Bible version, the English are very damaging. Because the way they have uh, written everything, it's a uh, clear evidence that they are attacking the deity of Christ. So that others would not know that who that people will not be able to understand that Jesus is God. But when you stick with the KSB Bible, it clearly says like this, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, and that are in earth, the visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers, or powers, all things were created by him, and for him. It does not say created by him and for them. It does not say they created by them and for him. Amen. It is created by him and for him. Because there is none like him and none beside him. Hallelujah. Heaven and earth, there is no other God. Even if you get into heaven, you will never see a tree or a certain person sitting down there in the throne of God. There is only one God in heaven. There is only one God on earth. So all things are created by Him and for Him. Why? Because there is none beside Him and none is like Him. And there is nobody else beside Jesus Christ. And therefore here it says, whether it is a heaven or earth, the visible or invisible, the entire universe, all things were created by Him and for him. In other words, created by Christ and for himself. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's what we see. So when you confront between this Isaiah 44 verse 24, we call it 1 16, you can easily understand that the Old Testament testified that Jesus is the one true God. And also you can see in John 1 3. The Gospel of John, St. John, chapter 1, verse 3 says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Look at verse 10. It says, He was in the wall, and the wall was made by him, and the wall made him not. Amen? So in other words, he was in the wall, and the wall was created by him, and the wall knew him. That means the people of this world, the Jewish people knew him not. Ever in verse 11 said, he gave his own and his own received him not. And also let's see again Exodus chapter 3. From Exodus chapter 3 again, you can see verse uh, 13 and 14. Let's focus on 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your father has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am that sent me. Me unto you. Amen. Hallelujah. And everybody knows that that this verb of scripture is actually a conversation between the God of Abraham, the human Isaac, and Moses. Hallelujah. And Moses saying, Lord, when he said, Go to the people of Israel. And when he said, Ask me, what is the name of our God? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto him, I am that I am. In other words, I am who I am. I am the self-existing God. I am the everlasting God. I am the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. This is what God had revealed to Moses. But at this point in time, 
God did not say, I am Jesus. The reason is that the saving name of Jesus Christ or the real name of God is not revealed in the Old Testament. So the saints of the Old Testament, you see that they were longing to know the real name of God. Or the, the saving name of God, they knew it. That Yahweh, Elohim, Elohim, all right, Adonai. These are not the real saving name of God, they knew that. So the sin of God were constantly longing to know the real name of God. But God didn't reveal it over there. But he did reveal it in the New Testament. Matthew 121 says, His name shall be called Jesus. Hallelujah. For he shall save his people from their sins. So therefore Isaiah. Look at Isaiah chapter uh, uh, 52 and verse uh, 6 says, Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that will speak it. Behold, it is I. From here we can see that the, the God of the Old Testament who is not in the God. Abraham recognized him, not to reveal it, is a true, a saving name of God. He have not revealed his real name to the saints of God in the Old Testament. But God made a promise over the earth. He says, in the future, my people shall know my name. Amen. I'll hear the word my people means the people of Israel and also the church. Who shall believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will eventually know that Jesus is God and that Jesus is the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they would know that Jesus would be the name of Yahweh. Amen. And Elohim. So that's the reason why instead of revealing his saving name to Moses, God says, uh, in revealed to him, he's a redemptive name of, of the title in the uh, Old Testament. He said, I am that I am. That's it. But the point here is that Jesus claimed again while he was on the earth 2,000 years ago that Jesus Christ indeed claimed that he is that Jehovah or Yahweh, the God of Moses, when he said in John chapter 8. See over here in John chapter 8, verse 50, uh, 6 to 58. This is how the Jesus Christ claimed. He said, Your father Abraham resolved to see my days. He resolved to see my days, and he saw it, he was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Hallelujah. Or he go amen. Which means, he's claiming to be the God of Abraham. That Jacob and Isaac, he was claiming to be the God of Moses. Hallelujah. And then it's a very interesting that according to Hebrews again, when you study from the Hebrews chapter 11, you can clearly see that the Hebrew writer is revealing that the God of <coughs> Moses was indeed Christ. Hallelujah. What did I, what did I just say? I said the Hebrew writer is revealing that Jesus is uh, truly the God of Moses. Amen. How do we know? Let's start again. Let's study from the Hebrew chapter 11. Look at here on verse 24 on the words. By faith, Moses. When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of, of Oros' daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Everybody underline verse 26. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 26. Right? Esteeming the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than the treasures in his eve, for he had respect unto the recompense of the rewards. Amen. Unlike that, praise the Lord. 
So here Moses is esteeming the reproach of who? Christ. Greater riches than the treasures and all the treasures that is in Amen. Why? Because Jesus is the God of Moses, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 to 26. Is the clear, solid evidence. <clears throat> but we know that in, in reality, if we go back to the Old Testament, we know, we know that Moses was dealing with the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, who is known as Yahweh. Amen. But according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 34 to 26, it's clear evidence, declared, Amen, the solid proof, because here the Hebrew writer is saying and revealing that actually Jesus is the God of Moses. Hallelujah. Because Moses was esteeming the reproach of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ, greater riches than all the treasures in his seed. Amen. But practically we know that in the Old Testament, that Moses was dealing with the one true God, who is known as the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. But according to this verse of scripture, according to this passage, we know that the writer is revealing or even uh, testifying. That Jesus is the God of Moses. Amen. See that? Then how if it is not that how can he say that Moses was esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure is in his name? Amen. See over here? Praise the Lord. So when you confront it like this, you can truly understand, you can see that indeed that Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament. So in short, we can understand that in the Old Testament does testify that Jesus is the one for God. So after examining all these verses of scriptures, we can make this conclusion that the Old Testament clearly said that the Messiah and the Savior to come would be God himself. Now in quickly, let's also survey again about the New Testament. What about the New Testament? Does the New Testament proclaim that Jesus is the one true God? Does the Bible, the New Testament, <coughs> testify that Jesus is God? Absolutely. First of all, I want you to turn the Bible with me to uh, the Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Let's quickly observe it over there. You can turn the Bible there in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Rather, uh, complete the readouts with a lot of ways. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Read long. Twenty-eight, yes. Exodus twenty, verse twenty-eight. Verse twenty-eight. Take heed, therefore, unto you, love, love, slave, and to all the, all of the, with the Holy Ghost, and make your ourselves to see the church of God, with the head, process with his. All right, thank you. So Acts chapter 2, uh, so sorry, Acts chapter 20 verse 28, clearly state that the church was purchased with God's own blood, namely the blood of Christ. Amen. But the question here is, how does God have the blood? If the essence of God is the spirit, how, can, how does he have the blood? Because according to 1 Timothy 3.16, that God was manifested in the flesh. That God was manifest in the flesh. Amen. But according to Acts 20 verse 20 it says, The church was purchased with God's own blood. We know that that is the blood of Jesus. And then we also see, according to Titus chapter 2 verse 13, say, Paul described Jesus as the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 1 even here, Apostle Peter described <coughs> Jesus Christ as God and our Savior, Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, clearly said that our bodies are the temple of God. 
Yet we know that Christ dwells in our hearts. Ephesians 3 verse 17. And then we can go on with Colossians 2 9. Okay, here Apostle Paul strongly emphasizes, <coughs> or we can say emphasizes, the deity of Christ. So Colossians 2, 2 verse 9 said, For in him. Let's read again Colossians 2 9. Let's observe it very carefully. For in him. In other words, for in Christ Jesus. Because here the singular pronoun, him, is referring to the one and only our Lord Jesus Christ. As we all know that. For in him. Amen. And the bracket can say, for in Christ Jesus dwell in all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And verse 10 says, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and power. Amen. So that means <clears throat> in Christ Jesus dwelleth all the fullness of the God and poverty. However, the Roman Catholic Church they exceeds, they keep on saying from the last more than 1,700 years back. From, from the last more than uh, uh, 1,500 years back, even to this day, they're still insisting and they're still lying to the people of this world saying that the God had is a mystery. What does it mean by that? What does it mean by God had is a mystery? In the sense that you cannot comprehend it, it is incomprehensible. You cannot understand it, you cannot grab it, you will not be able to understand it when you're human mind. <clears throat> so, they would all often say that if you try to understand the God has, you will lose your mind, and if you deny it, you will lose your salvation. So, according to Roman Catholicism, is that do not try to understand it. Don't ask questions. Don't raise the questions. Don't do that. Just believe it. Whatever the Greeks, whatever the Roman Catholic Greeks say, that's what you have to believe it. Don't believe it. Don't believe in the, you know, what others are saying. Just stick to that Roman priest. Just stick to them what the Pope or <clears throat> the Father is uh, saying. Don't raise the questions. So the God is a mystery in a sense that it is incomprehensible. But when you turn to the Bible, the New Testament, you can clearly understand that the God is not a mystery. Amen. It is absolutely clear. And fully revealed by the Almighty God, that in Christ, Jesus Christ, for in Him dwell in all the fullness of God and Father. That means the role of the Father, the role of the Son, the role of the Holy Spirit, all in the Godhead. They've been all fused together in that one. Amen. <coughs> together in the body of Christ. That means if you want to see Father, you can see in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to see the Son, it's in Him. If you want to see the Holy Ghost, you have to believe in Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> then if you want to see the Father, it's in Him. Hallelujah. Then He's all in all. He's our everything. He's our God and He's our all in all. Amen. That's what the scripture is revealing to us. <coughs> According to the scripture, there is one thing that is called a mystery. What was that mystery? In the New Testament, the mystery is no longer mystery in the New Testament. So this was a mystery that the Jews and the Gentiles to become one in Christ Jesus. This knowledge was not revealed to the saints of God in a very clear manner in the Old Testament. This was kept mystery. However, Apostle Paul said now that in the New Testament, it is no longer mystery. Hallelujah. Let's take it out about that. Since we're talking about the word of mystery, let's try to understand what is a mystery. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, or chapter 3, sorry. Let's begin reading from verse 1 onward. Uh, here, Apostle Paul is saying, For this was I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, 
If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to your how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I have a four in few words. So underline that, verse 3. How that by revelations he made known unto me the mystery. So the mystery was made known unto who? Apostle Paul. And what was the mystery, by the way? Is it regarding the Godhead? No. It's not regarding the Godhead. Amen. The God has been fully revealed in Christ Jesus. According to Galatians 2 9, all the fullness of the Godhead is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. But what was the mystery? The mystery was already revealed. All right? The revelation was on, or the secret was already revealed to Apostle Paul. And never it said, whereby, when you read, he understands. Uh, how did by revelation he made known unto me the mystery? So, what was the mystery? Let's focus from verse 4 and 5. Whereby, when you read, and he may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, everybody underline verse 5. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5. Here, Apostle Paul says, which in other ages was not made. Known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and the prophet by the Spirit. Verse 6, you can underline that verse 6 as well. That the Gentiles should be filled of ears, and of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Amen. So this was the mystery. That the Gentiles should be filled of ears and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So this was a mystery that the Jews and the Gentiles would become one in Christ. This was the mystery, but it's been no longer mystery in the New Testament. Hallelujah. See over here. Amen. That the Gentiles should be fellow peers and of the same body and partakers of his promise by Christ the gospel. That's it. But according to main main doctrine, the Roman Catholicism doctrine states that Godhead is a mystery. So don't try to understand the Godhead. Now the word the Trinity. Don't ask the questions. Don't raise any kind of a question. You just believe it. Don't accept it by faith. Huh? Don't raise the question. Therefore, I'm saying, if someone come to you and say, you know, I will not reveal it. Your future spouse is going to be your wife. All right, only after the marriage, when the solemnization is over, and uh, <clears throat> and that too, and, 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 uh, before we, uh, we go to sleep, at that time only you will have the okay the chance to see her, and before that you cannot even see her face. But if someone that sees and say, you know, just believe it. That she's a beautiful uh, in person. Don't raise the questions. Don't even ask for the. You know, don't insist for it, saying that you excuse the spouse. Just believe in me. Would anyone uh, agree with that? No. Before. You get into marriage, or before you step down into that solemnization in the name of the Lord, you would obviously want to know her first. You would obviously want to see her. The same goes for the woman, even for the girl. <clears throat> before you get into marriage, obviously you want to see him. Right? You want to know that person. At least you want to see how does he looks like. And all right, if someone in season say your mother and grandmother say, "Oh, you don't have to see him. You will only have the son to see him only after marriage." <laughs> would you agree? <laughs> it is something like that. You know? Don't raise the question. Just believe it, and just accept the fact that God has a mystery. But whereas the whole scriptures, whether from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, 
nowhere. The Holy Scripture says that the Godhead is a mystery. So this is how they fooled the people of this world for the last more than 1,500 years. It's very sad. And now let's go down again. According to Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, that whatever we need from God, we can find in Christ alone. Amen? So according to that Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9 and 10, it is absolutely clear that whatever we need from God, we can find in Christ alone. Why? Because Jesus is God. Hallelujah. Amen. So they were on the 20 verse 20. Thomas cried and said, My Lord and my God. Hallelujah. So there we can conclude that the whole New Testament fully testified to the full deity of Christ and the whole New Testament proclaimed and testified that Jesus is the one through God. Amen. Before we wind up here, I just want to go to Revelation 21. Let us turn the Bible to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Amen. Everyone focus on verse 7. Revelation 21 and verse 7 says, <clears throat> He that overcometh himself in the repose things, I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Underline that. He that overcometh himself in repose things. So, who are the overcometh, by the way? What does it mean by overcometh? It means that the people who pass from death unto life. The people who pass from the darkness into the marvelous light. The people who have faithfully obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and remain faithful till death. Amen. These are the overcomers. So here Jesus Christ is saying, our Lord is saying, He did overcome itself in the with all things, and I will be his God and his self in my son. If we are the church, if we are the son of God. If we are the son of Jesus, then who is he? He is our father. He is our God. Amen. Look at here. He shall be what? And I will be his God and he shall be my son. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Absolutely clear. And even when we get into heaven, let us see again Revelation 22 and verse 4. They shall see his face. And his name shall be there for him. It does not say they shall see their faces. If God exists in more than one in number, if God is more than one in person, if God is one in three separate persons, by the way, how the Roman Catholicism has defined the Godhead. It is absolutely clear that when we get into heaven, we will see their faces. Amen. If God is more than one, if God is one in three separate persons, then when we will get into heaven, the scripture has to say like this, we will see their faces. But what does the scripture say? Let's turn the Bible again. Let's read off together. All of you turn the Bible now and you get this market over there. Revelation 22 and verse 4. Okay, let's read off together. You can see from the case of the Bible, Brother Ephraim. <coughs> okay, I want to be going to Revelation 20 verse 4. I want to hear from you. Let me speak a bit louder. Revelation 22 and verse 4. Okay, let's speak together. A bit louder. Just speak on the phone. And they shall see his face, and his hand shall be in their forehead. One more time. And they shall see in his face, and his hand shall be in their forehead. Amen. It does not say they shall see his face, 
It is also they shall see their faces, but it's at His face. Whose face? The face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And His name. It does not say their names. It says His name shall be in their forehead. Hallelujah. Now this verse of scripture is also very much okay. A proof that Jesus is indeed the Almighty God. So this verse of scripture is clearly testified that Jesus, our Lord, indeed is our God. Not just for today, but for everlasting. Amen. From eternity to eternity, He will continue to remain our Father and our God. And therefore, when we get into heaven, <coughs> we will see His face and His name shall be in our prayer. Amen. Praise the Lord. In other words, we shall see His glory. We'll know more about Him. His name shall be in our forehead means because of His name we have the salvation. And through His name, that we will have the salvation. And that is the reason why you can see the New Testament church does everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so, we, so we can understand that whatever we need from God, we can find in Jesus Christ the Lord. And then we can conclude that the entire New Testament or the Holy New Testament does testify to the full deity price and the New Testament fully proclaims that Jesus is indeed the one true God. Amen. And for those who are still confused about it, I want you to turn about with me to John chapter 14. For the final one, I want you to just put it from John 14. <clears throat> and we can go on with all day explaining of one after another. But I think this will also sufficient enough for you to uh, understand more deeper on the subject of the need to Christ. Look at verse 7. Then Jesus said, If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Now if the Father is a separate person from the Lord Jesus Christ, then I have this small humble question, and that is, where and when did the apostle have an access, or the disciple have an access to have seen the Father and to have known the Father? Where? Do they have the wings to flee all the way to heaven? Planeam. He saw his anointing as a planeam. Planeam. Okay. Oh, 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 what they're talking. So what does Jesus say? And so you have seen him and known him. Who? The Father. Amen. And there was Jesus said, Henceforth you have known him and seen him. In other words, you have already known him. You have already seen him. And upon this, Philip was so confused that he started raising his questions and he said, Philip said unto him, Lord, see what the Father is sufficient. And then Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you and yet has thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me, he that has seen me, has seen the Father. And how sayest thou that see what the Father? Believest thou not? That I am the Father and the Father in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very works. In other words, Jesus said, at least for the evidence of the miracle themselves, believe me that I am the Father or I am God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Then other, the other reference I want to provide over here is John chapter 5. Let's see again, John chapter 5 verse 39.
And here in verse 39, the Jesus said, Sir, the Spirit for in them, you think you have eternal life, and they are the testifies of me. And he will not come to me that he might have life. So Jesus said these words, these phrases, uh, you know, this scripture per se, it was saying to the people of Israel. It was addressing the people of Israel, especially to the scribes and Pharisees. And he said it to them, you people saw the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are the testifiers of me. Hallelujah. At that very point of time, at that very moment, we know that the New Testament was just developing. It was not fully developed. Amen. The New Testament was not fully developed because Jesus Christ the Lord was not yet crucified in the Calvary. And even the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was not even established. Because this was established on the day of Pentecost. Amen. So at this point of time, if you look at the context when you say the scripture, he was referring to the entire Holy Scripture of the Old Testament. He was referring to the Tanakh, the Torah, Amen, and the whole Scripture of the Old Testament. Because that's what the Jewish community, the Jewish people, the rabbis and scribes and Pharisees, whenever you talk about the Scripture, they said, only the Old Testament is the Holy Scripture. According to the Jews, According to the scribes and Pharisees, only the Old Testament is the scripture. That's what they believe even to this day. The 2,000 years may have already passed, but even to this day, they still believe that only the Old Testament is the Holy Scripture. So Jesus was saying, Challenging man, <clears throat> why don't you show the scripture? For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are the testifiers of me. In other words, he's saying, the whole Bible, amen, the whole scripture in the Old Testament testify that I am God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then he goes on to say, you can hear again, verse 46, for had he believed in Moses, he would have believed in me, for he wrote of me. Hallelujah. Wow. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So Jesus saying that even your father Moses, the Torah, which contains Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, is saying that this whole scripture, Moses wrote about me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And then he goes on to say, but if he believed not his writings, and now he exposes the Pharisees. And the scribe is saying that you people may have lip service and may say that you believe in Moses, but in reality, you people do not believe in Moses and nor in his writings. And they were said, But if you believe not his writing, how shall you believe my words? Hallelujah. So, therefore, my friend, it is a very clear that when you confront between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and when you all put together, and when it contrasts one another, both the Old Testament and New Testament, we come to this conclusion that both the Old Testament and the New Testament, all right, fully adore and fully amen, testified and proclaimed that Jesus, our Lord, is the one true God. So to put it simply, everything that God is Jesus. Everything that God is, that is Jesus is. And we know that Jesus is the one true God. And therefore there is no better way to sum up, or there is no better way to sum it, all up to say, with the inspired Apostle Paul, where he said in verses 2 9, For in him, for in Christ Jesus, dwell in all the fullness of God and Father in and we are complete in Him. They had all the principalities and power. Hallelujah. So this is for today, this morning. And your assignment for the coming, uh, for the next class is this. You have to write a down paper, a topic on the deity of Jesus.
Jesus Christ. Everyone, you can write it down. I want you not wait. Okay, from the Old Testament and the New Testament, you have to prove it with a scriptural backup, with all the scriptural references. Amen. So we'll be relying only from the scripture references, not from historical evidences. But we'll be relying from the scripture evidences to prove that Jesus is God. Amen. According to the Old Testament and the New Testament. So your assignment topic is this. The deity of Jesus Christ. Simple. I repeat again. The deity of Jesus Christ. Amen. Is that clear? Alright then, so we'll rise up now and I just want to give you a little bit off a bit early so that you can have more time to study and do your assignment. Or at the same time, it's already uploaded on your <coughs> WhatsApp group about your textbook. You can start writing from there, you can just open it up. And uh, I will re upload it again and re post it down on our groups. You can just re uh, observe it again. And from there, you can take all knowledge about it. And I want you to write it how you write it exactly. But well, let me see how you write it. Write it separately. Proof from the, all the scripture references. Back, in, uh, back it up with uh, his uh, biblical references. The scripture references are the topic of the deity of the scriptures. Okay? That's it. Okay, so we all rise up and sing one more hymn from uh, uh, Song Six, Amazing Grace. So we all rise up. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, guys, let's uh, sing on this song and then we'll pray. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.
Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Right, thank you guys for this call. Amen. Take your time and we can yes. Thank you. For those who have a question, anytime you can meet me, then you can come to my office and have this.